Hi, I'm Russ Heaps, your face made for radio host of Beer to Whiskey. And in my ongoing mission to spread the gospel of good taste today, I find myself just outside of San Diego in Del Mar, California. And I'm at one of the newer breweries in the area. It's Viewpoint Brewing Company. Uh, before I introduce the, uh, my fellow panelists here and, and we start talking about the beer, however, I've got a little uh, uh, shameless self-promotion to do, and that is, you see the little thumb up down on the screen? If you like what you're seeing, click on that, please. If you want to see more videos, hang on until the end. You'll have an opportunity to click on some other videos. Or if you want to subscribe, the little round uh, Beer to Whiskey logo there, click on that and... Uh, and you'll be subscribed. It doesn't cost anything. New videos come out at noon every Thursday, East Coast time. Enough of the foreplay. Uh, I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here with the uh, with the head brewer and the owner of Viewpoint. We've got <laughs> here we go. We got Mo Katomsky. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, I got through that one. And uh, sitting next to him is the owner, Charles Cole. And guys, uh, thanks for the invite. Love being time, here, yeah. and it and I think we spoke earlier. It just so happens that a uh, buddy of mine and I were in here two weeks ago um, on a, another event that we were down here for, and happened to wander in here, had some good good beer, and smelled some very good food, although we didn't get to eat. So, Charles, tell me how did how did this get started? How did how did this brewery get going? So Viewpoint Brewing Company started off as Vigilante Brewing Company, actually. Uh, Vigilante was um, the concept that we're going to produce a brewery and a restaurant that is defending the integrity of the ingredients that we use, be it um, the grains in, in, in the beer or whether it's the, or grains and hops in the beer or whether it's, um, you know, the fr farm fresh ingredients that we get for our cuisine. Um, when I first was even conceptualizing the idea, I was working at a restaurant called Prep Kitchen Del Mar. And at that restaurant, I was bringing in my homebrew recipes for the staff and for everyone to try. And uh, the owner, um, Arturo, uh, came up to me and said, listen man, this, these beers are, are pretty solid and we'd love uh, if you could brew these for, for our restaurant. And so I started putting together a business plan to try to figure out how I would be able to legally produce beer for um, the restaurant. And one thing ended up being, one thing led to another. And, you know, uh, the idea of scaling up seemed um, to lead to what I have now. You know, originally it was like going to be a one barrel. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, cool. I have to brew every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> and, uh, Yes. <laughs> we just started starting just pushing that ball forward and figuring out, okay, where do we need to go so that we can do everything that we want to do and also still have a weekend. Um, and, I mean, long story short, we still don't get weekends, but we ended up with a 15-barrel brew house and a full-service restaurant. Um, and unfortunately, are not able to produce enough beer outside of this little establishment at this point to start distributing to the restaurant uh, that originally got me started. Um, however, they are now in the works of, of uh, building their own brewery, so it's kind of cool how that worked out. But um, we've been doing very, very well for ourselves here in this little location. We've been open about 10 months, and uh, God bless the fair and our location and yeah. our, our public support, and especially the neighborhood, because they have been behind us every step of the way, and it's been really, really wonderful to see. And so, Viewpoint. What, what's the what's the nature of oh, that? Okay, well that's a great great story too. So, um, trademark infringement is a very popular uh, topic in a lot of breweries. When you have um, you know a little over 150 breweries in San Diego, is, is that right? It's about 150. Yeah, it's right. right it's, there. it's going up every day. It's going up. Right. But um, then spread that across the entire United States with every little pocket of um, of, of you know towns having this kind of boom in the microbrewing industry. Uh, and then try to think of a name for yourself that hasn't been taken, it's kind of tough to do. <laughs> so we ended up uh, calling ourselves Vigilante, and then a brewery in the Midwest had a Vigilante IPA. And so I contacted them asking them if it would be okay to um, call myself Vigilante Brewing Company. And you know, a lot of people are like, oh, but they need beer, you know, how is that fair? And then uh, the greatest analogy of all times was uh, well, imagine if you called yourself Sculpin Brewing Company. And I was thinking, yeah, Bell's probably have a problem with that one too. Right. So 
you know, no fighting, no hard feelings, decided that's that's a great time to rebrand and change my name. Um, however, I couldn't think of a darn thing. So my sister-in-law was helping me come up with names and she was taking a walk uh, down the river path here and lo and behold was hanging out at the viewpoint and thought, Viewpoint Brewing Company, we have the view and most importantly, uh, it embodies our vision of defending the food and beer and, and really taking care of those ingredients by just re reinventing the, the terminology so that Viewpoint stands for our perspective on what we think beer and food should be and how they should be produced and to the level of quality and integrity that it should be produced. So we all come from fine dining backgrounds, so we all have the technique and ability to produce fine dining food. Brewing is a little bit on the um, on the newer side of things for us. Sure. However, we take that same ethos and that same sort of vow to make sure that the beers that we're producing are clean, high, you know, highly productive in, in the term of uh, what they're meant to do, such as our experiment A is not supposed to be bitter. It's supposed to be an easy drinking kind of lager-esque ale um, that a lot of our clientele is looking for, while also producing you know, IPAs, where you're really letting that hop shine through and right. kind of reducing the amount of malt bill um, and not having the grain play so much of a part, especially on the West Coast, as you know. Uh, we like dry, bitter beer. So being able to play and find those balances and lucky for us, we both have a lot of friends in the industry and that can help guide us and, 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 and mentor us into becoming better brewers. So, Mo, have you been here for the entire 10 months? Were you on the... Uh, I have, yeah. I came on around April, so a couple months before we opened and actually helped Charles finish building the place as well, which was a whole other site. Myself, our chef Gunner, Charles, Caitlin, our event coordinator, we've all been here day one, sanding tables and... Swinging hammers. Yep. <laughs> Paint, so, painting. It's been a good time. So was this was this um, a group effort, the, de the decision to open this place? Did did you sit down with some of these people ahead of time and go, this is what I'm, I'm spitballing about here and what do you guys think? Or did you find these guys after, bring them aboard after you'd already made the decision? <sighs> I don't know. We got a bit of both, actually. <laughs> yeah. So when I first wanted to open up this brewery, I mean, that was, you know, first of all, Mo was still in school at San Marcos. Yeah. And um, I was kind of putting this thing together and I was like, yeah, this will be done in a year. You know, three years later, <laughs> uh, we, we figured it out. But that's it got to the point where- That's what they, they say, tell, tell God your plans and listen to them laugh. Go yeah. Ahead. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's pretty well put. That's crazy. So, so basically that was the situation where I was getting it started and I was talking to Mo about it. And uh, Mo was obviously busy with school, so it wasn't really like one of those things. I think he always wanted to do it, but it was just not, yeah. timing was awful. Same thing with Gunner Planter. I, in fact, um, was down in um, university, at the university club where he was working uh, at the time and trying to poach him to become my chef. And that was a year and a half out. And I was like, oh, yeah. cool. maybe I jumped the gun on that one a little bit. Thank God he, <laughs> he turned me down. But uh, then he, he, he left that restaurant and went to the Rancho Santa Fe Inn um, and was looking for a change. And um, I just kind of like out of a whim, I, I, I contacted him to see how he was doing and whether or not he'd be interested. And he was all about it. And same thing with Mo. In fact, actually Mo's story is kind of funnier because I approached Mo asking him if he knew of any brewers that'd be interested in the position. And he said he couldn't think of anybody. I was like, no, I'll, I'll help you look, but do you want your homebrew equipment back too? Because I, <laughs> I didn't, want, didn't mean it anymore. Yeah. He didn't want my homebrew stuff at his house. So, uh, and then like a week or two later, I was just like, well, why don't you be the brewer? And he goes, mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. Why not? So that's you had been you had been home brewing. I was home brewing. I had worked a little bit out in Vista for a couple months, um, but I knew the size operation he was trying to run, and I personally didn't have that full experience. So I wanted him to really approach me about it. Right. I I mean I was giving him all the beers I was making. I was home brewing two to three times a week, ten gallon batches. It was insane. Wow. I mean I had more beer at home than you wouldn't know what to do with. So I just let him try them, and we're drinking one night, and he's like. Come on, like, let's just make this happen. We homebrewed together. We know we can work together. Let's just, let's do it. And I mean, so have any of last your, year has been amazing. Have, <laughs> it, have any of your- Building the place, brewing. Have any of your home homebrews made it onto the menu A here? couple of them. Penance Man IPA, I didn't pour that for us today. 
Um, the Mandarina is actually one of Charles's first homebrew recipes. Uh, different hops are involved now. Um, not too many other the homebrew recipes. I, I really like talking to this guy. I'll take. I'll bring some ideas. We'll talk about it. We'll we'll taste grains and you know, we'll actually steep them every once in a while. Throw some hops in right. there and actually get flavor profiles. And it's amazing the changes that we make to each other's recipes and they come out nice. It's also fun brewing separately. I mean, I went on vacation. I was, he was nice enough to let me go our first year in. And he brewed a couple batches, which we're gonna try today. The strawberry blonde, he brewed an IPA and- While you were gone. Yeah. That's what we called it. Funny enough, right? <laughs> and is they, is it, that right? It's yeah. funny. They're just so different than my style of brewing, which is yeah. amazing. It's, it's, it's unique to go to a brewery and really taste different styles of beers. Sure. Sometimes you get stuck in making, like you're in your comfort zone and people are like what you make, so you keep making very similar style things. And we have such a different palate that I'm gonna brew one way and he's gonna brew another. And it's fun to collaborate, but when we both brew separately, that's where we really get some contrast and you can reach, you can really reach more people. And somebody says they don't like beer, they might like one of his and hate all, everything I've made. And I think it's beautiful. It's one of those. Uh, it really is. I mean, everyone's palate's different, so. <laughs> right. And on that note, sorry for the plug, but your individual perspectives creates our viewpoint. Yeah. So that's why uh, that's why the name is appropriate, but it's also what we do on a daily basis. Do you have uh, Do you have some year rounders? Some things that you that you have on well, the stick all the time. We're less than a year in. My goal for the first six months was to really keep everything we open with on top, and branch out. We've worked our way up to 16 different beers on top over the winter. I know we're going to decrease uh, just because we're not going to be able to keep with production for right. summertime. Um, but there's probably six or seven I'd like to see stay on the menu and then I'd really like to rotate some other stuff out, really ask our clientele what they're looking for if they miss anything. Um, I've wanted to not make our red rye IPA a lot, but we've gotten a lot of feedback from that. And I love the beer. I think I just drank too much of it personally when we first opened yeah. because <laughs> well, we had that in Mandarina and, and Experiment A for three months. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we drank a bunch eventually of you want something fresh. I mean, it's delicious. And we've actually made a whiskey out of the beer with some friends that are opening a distillery as well. So, I mean, the talk is kind of nice, actually. We should have should have brought a little sample of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, we should leave no stone unturned. Well, we have a little bit in the back. Maybe we'll pull it out at the end. All right. Actually, Excellent. Do, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, is there, you guys are, are, you're trying to use local ingredients? Is that the, is that the deal? If as we're going we to, can. yeah. As much as we can. Any type of adjuncts or fruit or anything like that, we've done collaborations with um, La Berge Hotel, Kitchen 1540, Chef Nathan up there has been amazing. We've done a cranberry fennel saison with him uh, here to sample today. Um, if you want to have a nice little taste as we talk about it, it's a... Uh, Cheers. Yeah. This is a kumquat and agave hefeweizen. So he's an American hefeweizen yeast. So it's a little, not as much banana on it, but it allows us to bring out more of the fruit. Kind of more like, yeah, like American wheat ale. Is, is yeah, the, it, is the that's least offensive to the Germans that yes, you possibly there you go. Yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah, I think that's a good description. Uh, but the kumquats they actually grew locally on their property as well. So they reduced it down, came over. We we added it in. My first day back from vacation, actually, I walked into Charles Stone. I'm in there with Nathan, and I think it came out quite nice. My favorite thing about this beer is that you know kumquats naturally have this um, bittersweet kind of uh, element going yeah. on with them because the rind, the, the, the pith on the inside is actually really, really bitter, but it's the rind on the outside that's really, really sweet. And then the juicy juice from the inside, from the pulp, that's, that's where you get a little bit more of the acidity from. And we use the entire, the entire kumquat in this beer. We just chopped them up and threw them in. So we didn't puree them or anything like that. We pretty much made like a jam. And yeah. um, the, 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 the other secondary part why I think this beer is, is fun is because it still tastes like beer. It's not, it's not one of those fruit beers where it, you know, it's like a juice bomb. Right. And you're, you're getting a lot more of that element on it. When we try our, our strawberry Belgian, you're going to get a lot of that too. It's still going to you're gonna taste strawberries, but you're going to really, really taste the, uh, the Belgian beer flavor of it as well. You know, uh, one of you guys was asking me earlier if I had tried the, uh, the Saison. And I did because I, had, I, drank, I drank it at the bar at the hotel. 
Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah, they had it on tap. They had it on tap when we were staying there. And we had just been down here and had a couple of beers and walked back up and sat at the bar. And I said, yeah, let me, you know, I didn't try one of those. Let me have one of those. And it was pretty good. I'm, I'm, I, Saison's are growing on me. Okay. Um, sours, not yet, but Saison's are, are growing on me. Yeah, Saison's have a nice spice level to them. We use a French Saison yeast. Uh, Belgians will be a little fruitier, right? typically. That one has a nice uh, spice characteristic yeah. to it, which I think balances yep. off the cranberry and then the fennel as well, the little licorice flavor you get off of it. Nice punch for that little yeah. you know, Thanksgiving season. Sure. Because we missed the boat for Oktoberfest beer. Yeah. So we're like, ah, oh, cool, no November fest. <laughs> so is there, is there something that you guys haven't produced that uh, you're, you're kind of agreed on? Yeah, this is, this is what we got to try next. We got to do... How much time do you have? <laughs> I really want to do a Pilsner or a lager. I think a Czech style Pilsner would be first, uh, just for fermentation time. That's what I would really like to do. He might have a completely different oh, I have a <laughs> idea, and then we're going to end up doing those first. <laughs> Isn't it's that just the way what, it works? It, it's just we'll whoever has a better timing. We'll lager you know? <laughs> stuff in the wintertime when we're slower for sure. Um, but no, I really want to do a uh, oh, Blue IPA. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that's a, that's a style that's being popularized right now up in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, and basically what it is, is it's a, it's a very, very dry uh, grain bill, so it's like just, you know, puckering dryness yeah. Yeah. with uh, very little bittering hops and then a crap load of uh, aromatic and uh, flavoring hops. So the idea of it is that you have like almost like a champagne-y uh, style beer, but it's still beer. It still actually has that whole kind of like taste to it but with that element of uh champagne which i i think is really really cool so if i'm back here in six months i'm going to get to taste one of these things you think either that or a lager all right <laughs> well see there's a i think you'll get the brewed ipa before then but yeah yeah i'm itching to brew that one yeah uh last year we were it was a little hectic in here for our grand opening of oh, opening sure. day of the race season so it was hard to keep up we started with seven beers went down to three in two weeks so <laughs> yeah. we were selling quite a bit of uh, beer in house which is amazing yeah and I love that we're selling everything in house because we really get as he said we all have culinary backgrounds so beer and food we really work hard to make some fun pairings on our menu so the uh, the kitchen and I, as I mentioned earlier when I was here a couple of weeks ago we didn't we didn't sample the food because we were had plans to go eat with a group but um, the food looked really good and it smelled really good are you guys doing anything uh, in terms of uh, working the food menu around the beers or is there is there any real thought put into that oh there's definitely some yeah. thought around the whole concept of that I feel uh, Gunner and myself will talk constantly charles included him and gunner have separate conversations the three of us get together and we geek out on food and right. beer and different flavors we can use and infuse when we when we create recipes we generally will taste them taste the recipe with the beer and make adjustments conscious or, or subconscious it's, it's one of those things that we're eating and drinking at the same time so that sort of element um, really helps you to kind of develop your 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 sort of pairing, um, as well as just kind of uh, utilizing beer in in certain um, elements of our food. So, for example, we obviously this is the, the easiest one, but our muscle dish is done with a beer broth, right? Where we just basically steam them in beer. Okay. And then one step further, uh, we do a so we have a um, uh, a backyard burger. This is one of my favorite ones because Chef and I went back and forth on this for a long time. This was a good one. We, uh, we, we were, we were like figuring out, like, okay, cool. Like, we're going to do a gourmet burger. Uh, the gourmet burger is going to be based on something else. Who is our favorite burger in town? And, you know, like, obviously you're talking about all these other gourmet burgers. No, like, screw that stuff. That's just... It's not garbage, but, like, it's, it's far away from what we're trying to accomplish. Sure. In and out. Yes. Everyone knows it. Every other state knows it. I mean, you know, you have Shake Shack, but those yeah, guys, no, you've got those guys are still trying to learn how to. In and out is pretty burger. is pretty well known around so. the country, oh, whether yep. you've had one or hadn't had it. Exactly. So that is what we are emulating. 
and also was Hessen Blumenthal too, the way that he breaks down the burgers and talks about the different textures of the meat compared to the type of cheese that you use, the melting temperature, the texture of that cheese. And basically, in my mind, the perfect cheese is American cheese. It has the creamy flavor you're looking for and the texture of, of, of gooiness that you want without the stringiness of like melted cheddar, you know, where it like yeah, draws yeah. like mozzarella, where it has like that pizza effect. And so I was like, okay, cool. We're putting American cheese on the burger. Kraft Singles to be specific. Specifically Kraft Singles. <laughs> that is what he <laughs> wanted. Tell like, chef I'm, all, Kraft singles I'm all about craft beer, oh, no but way. I'm also about craft Singles. Okay, it's in the name. It is good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Obviously, Chef did not like that, and because uh, everything we do is scratch. Yeah. And uh, he's like, we're not putting craft singles on. And I was like, fine, make me a craft singles. And so he did. Um, researched a bunch of recipes on how to make American cheese, and then tweaked the flavor profiles of the American cheese uh, to what his liking was for the actual flavor composition, um, while still appeasing me and giving me the creamy texture and the bite that I was looking for out of that burger. And it is absolutely amazing. And we use beer in that, as well as another byproduct. You're obviously a pain in the ass to work for. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why he's best made great stuff. That's why we love him. Come on. But it's not about, it's not about, it's about challenging ourselves to what we can Daily, do. Yeah. Right. And making sure that when we work, we push ourselves to make things better and, and, and raise the bar on ourselves. Because resting on your laurels is the first thing to, to, to sure. starting to fail. Yep. And we refuse to do that. So the, the solution was, now you make your own cheese. Now we make our oh, own yeah. cheese. And our burgers are one of our best selling items yeah. by far. So yep. it's not like it's an easy task to just make that much cheese to keep up with demand. So, crap singles might have been a little easier for him in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> but, that's, but he's got pride. It's not only but no that. way. Yeah, but he'll never know, let that happen. You know, <laughs> when I go in, when I when I go into a joint and I order a grilled cheese sandwich, that's what I want. Yeah. I don't want some kind of gouda. You know, so come in and get a grilled cheese with our beer cheese on it next time. Yeah, you know that's. You know, I want. Yeah, I want the kind of grilled cheese that my mom made me when I was six years old. Yeah. That's what I want. That's what, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's. I'm. I'm with you 100 percent, Charles. I'm with you 100 percent. I knew I wasn't crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I don't know that my. Don't tell him that. Come I don't on. know that my my agreeing with you. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it let you escape that uh, thing. Okay, what are we doing next here? All right, um, pick one. Let's go with the middle one. This is our mosaic, so it's a smash beer. You know what a smash beer is? No. It's a uh, single me. malt and single hop. Okay. So we use all Maris solder, then we use mosaic all the way through, bittering edition, uh, late edition, whirlpool, and we also dry hop with 22 pounds of in there. So you get big fruit off the nose. Uh, Mouthfeel is definitely there from the marisotter. A little bit of breadiness to it. Yeah. Uh, a little bit more than two row, which yep. is a little cleaner or a, pils or a pilsner malt, but. So the cool thing about smash beers is that it, on the one side, yeah, it's very simple, right? But then on the other, it allows you to really acknowledge what certain ingredients we're gonna do to the beers and how they're gonna do it to the beers. Um, especially with the grain side of things. Because the grain side of things you mash in, um, you know, depending on your temperature that you mash in at, it creates your dryness or your sweetness. Um, and then after the boil and after fermentation, you can get a solid read on like, boop, that's the flavor profile that you're gonna be getting out of it. So doing it with Maris Otter or Golden Promise, or even just straight two row, uh, is gonna give you all these different kind of levels of flavor. And that's why when you build a recipe, um, taking those ingredients and utilizing them in terms, and thinking about them in terms of flavor uh, composition, like how much of this do I want? Okay, the last one was like really bready. So I'm gonna cut that back. I'm gonna stick some two row in there, really clean it up, make it sort of like on the back burner as, as far as like my grain bill goes. Um, and it allows us to educate ourselves and at the same time educating guests without producing a bad beer or, or, or something that's not pal not right. palatable. Right. Uh, it's still very drinkable, but it gives you a distinct flavor, bill, which I love. It is. It is good. Um, but you're right. The bread, boy, it is. It is kind of bready. Mm -hmm. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if and if people don't understand what a smash beer is, where they come in and they really don't, they're intimidated because they, it's something they haven't tried. It's right. it's very similar to a pale ale. Is a way. 
I think of it. I think of it more as a session because of the way we hopped it. It is a hoppy pail for sure. Um, it's 5.8%, so it's a little heavy for a session IPA, but yeah. this is what I gave you when you first came in. You said, I'll take something a little sessionable. Yep. It, I mean, to me, it's easy drinking. It's got a little body to it, but definitely the fruity floral notes. What was the ABV on this one again? 5.8. Yeah, summertime slammers. Exactly. Perfect. I, I got off an airplane and came immediately over here, and uh, I needed a beer bad. This, <laughs> this is what I got. It was just and one was, this size. I mean. <laughs> it was a little one. It wasn't... <laughs> But yeah, I like it. One of my favorite beers that we ever uh, made was actually a Centennial Smash. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not a crowd favorite. At all. Uh, which it was a bummer. Which, yeah, it was really big. <laughs> to say the least, I <laughs> love that beer too, man. It was just pine for it. And but it was, it was, that, old, it was mm. that old school kind of, just, I mean, Centennial, right? It's yeah. pine. And God, I wish people would brew more of those beers. Everything now is so fruit forward, and I, I mean, it's not bad, like, I love it, but now, just like everything else, I've drinking way too much of it, and I want to go back to my piney beers. <laughs> <laughs> I miss them. <laughs> so, what else we got here? Guys. You pick one off. Um, let's do the Mandarina, because I like the story behind this one. And the story being? So this was one of Charles's original recipes. He wanted it, he used citra in, but when we first opened, we couldn't get citra hops. So we used mandarina, which I had used in Hefeweizen recipes, but I knew it gave off uh, big fruity notes. So we were home brewing, um, well, before the build out really even happened. And we used it, we liked it. We were going all mandarina. And then Pizza Port was kind enough to, um, give us some Medusa hops and we dry hopped with Medusa, which really brought out the citrus so much more. And it's a really unique hop that's grown in New Mexico, uh, strictly in New Mexico. And it's not used in a lot of beers, but it you really packs a now, punch. Yeah. And I might regret saying this since I'm telling everyone about it. Because <laughs> uh, it's, it's in high demand by people who have used it in the past, and it's really difficult to get, even on contract, so. Really? Um, but it's a fun hop. It, it is just beautiful, yeah. One of the first questions you said are, are, was, uh, do you want do you want to keep six, your core beers on tap? And my perspective is absolutely not. Um, we're a brew pub, we don't distribute. <laughs> I mean, obviously we have recipes that are winners and we should keep brewing those, absolutely. But we, we don't distribute and we're a brew pub and people come here for the experience of trying new things food, beer, and the hospitality and the view. Yeah. And that being said, it allows us the opportunity to take advantage of that and brew different styles of beers and to come up with new recipes and to play. I mean, granted, our homebrew system is 15 barrels, so if we screw something up, it hurts, but yeah. um, the risks are, are, are worth it because if you do push that boundary and you try to do something really, really cool, um, hey, every now and then a blind squirrel finds a nut, right? So do you have aspirations to Take over the world, yeah. Yeah. To, <laughs> Always. to distribute and oh yeah. You know, I, I don't I don't know where it's going in terms of in terms of that. I just I really want to keep pushing that that boundary as far as what we can do. Um, I know we're gonna have to sell a lot more beer in order to get there, so that's on the radar. Uh, but it's got, I want to do. Do you, do you have the space not. here to to expand a whole lot? Not yeah. right now. Not I, I, I didn't think so. That's why we do almost everything in house and. On your distribution, I would love to grow it, as Charles said, organically and just naturally to bars we enjoy and then other places along the way who have a good reputation and really care about the product. And right. That, that's my main concern when we, when we do start distributioning is when we give our beer to someone, make sure it's going to be tended to properly. It's going to be held at the appropriate temperature. It's going to be served out of a clean draft line. And yeah. I mean, well, there's good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> but there are there are companies that do it. Uh, yeah. uh, Society, Russian River, um, Modern Times. They go to. Uh, they are in a lot of bars, and they still go and they make sure at least their one draft line gets changed annually. And there are some good big companies out there that really do take pride in it, and it's yeah. something that yeah, I really I, do yeah. respect. I, I mean, I know what you're saying. <laughs> good luck. Cause, I mean, it's it, it is. It's it's it's, it's another. You have to care. It's another hurdle you have to jump over. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? It's. Worth it. For, for what we focus on here now, 
being the hospitality side of, of, of beer and of, of uh, obviously the restaurants, I think too, um, I want to make damn sure that anything that people put on their mouth, whether it's beer or food, wherever it may be, yeah. sure. they're leaving with the positive taste in their mouth. One of the one of the great things about craft beers today is you guys are doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. And uh, and and I'm repeating myself from something I've said on other segments that I've shot. But if somebody says, "Oh, I don't like beer," it's just because they haven't oh, tried the on right in. one yet. That's like Please saying you don't like food. In. Right. Yeah. It's you just haven't had the right the right beer yet. We had someone in the other day. She told me she didn't like IPA, so I gave her a double IPA. <laughs> really? She loved it. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. She didn't like bitterness. Our double IPA, uh, this new batch did come out a little bit uh, more bitter and hoppier, so I might not be able to replicate this, but our last batch was a little sweeter. Yeah. Um, so as Charles said, we constantly mess with our recipes. We're trying to develop them. We're talking about, so we got to adjust. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. Things. So sure. Like, that's what got to experiment and see what yeah. everyone really likes, but she came in and she loved it, and I wouldn't tell her what it was. She's like, what is this? Double IPA, and now she's drinking IPAs all the time, and mainly doubles but you know and, whatever and, and doubles will and, and, and to the, that point of balance with the sweetness side of things a regular yeah. IPA will be a lot drier than a double because you got all that sugar in it uh, and, the alcohol. and your, your gravity is higher too and, and the alcohol is higher yeah. but more importantly you need more bitter to complement the um, higher grain bill the sweetness and, yeah. that, and that's why you know yeah you have these doubles um, but they do tend to be a little bit sweeter which is definitely appealing to a certain type of palate you know, if that's what gets somebody into a craft brewery and, you yeah. know, to, to have some beers with their pals, then... Yeah. Perfect. Yep, exactly. In my mind. Exactly. That's what we're about, is creating a unique experience here and really opening people's minds to... What, what would you guess the, the beer would be that would convert most wine drinkers? Wow. I... I, I would think a uh, saison is what I would think. That oh, was a pretty solid guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that was that was what we. Uh, that's what. Yeah. That's usually what for we us use. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's because of you know the sort of uh, herbaceousness that you get from it. Most wine drinkers that um, don't like beer don't like beer because they're used to maybe the kind of more uh, mainstream ones like you know like Coors or Budweiser or those. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Saisons always catch people by surprise because they're not what people right. anticipate a beer to be yep. inside. So what's this? This is Charles's creation right here. What? <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. This is a strawberry Belgian blonde. We use an oh, artisanal okay. yeast on it. So it's not a, a typical Belgian yeast that you find all around. And I had some of this earlier. I really like this. It's, we're kegging it off today, actually. So it's as fresh as you can get it. Uh, perfect for summertime, I think. Around 6.2%. Very drinkable. And oh, I don't yeah. like Belgians, and this is... Awesome. Yeah, that's my favorite part about working with him. I love him. He hates him. <laughs> but he made a Belgian. That's the beauty of working with someone. It's changing their mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? White Winning them over little <laughs> by little. Oh, by yeah. <laughs> Every day is a win. <laughs> Are you familiar with White Labs? Uh, no. So White Labs produces yeah, they're great. Um, copious amounts of yeast trades for uh, yeah. breweries all across the United States and internationally as well. Um, they have a tasting room here in San Diego. It's really, really cool because what they'll do is they'll give you a flight uh, where they do a single uh, wort that is pitched differently with different yeasts. Yeah. So you can you can do the same thing like a, our, what we do with our smash beers where we, where we taste our different grain and our different hop singularly. They do the same thing but with uh, yeast, yeast. Yeah. And so when I uh, was like, okay, cool, I'm going to do a strawberry blonde. I'm going to do it Belgian because it works. I hate Belgians. <laughs> well, no, mostly because it's like challenging yourself too at the same time. You know, like you want to see what, what you can get out of it. Um, and plus, I mean, the strawberry blondes is not a new thing, but I, 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 I'm sure somebody else has done a strawberry Belgian blonde, but I didn't do my research. So I, didn't, I, didn't, I was like, yeah, sweet, I'm going to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, saying, yeah. Houston, come on, man, we go to Hell House all the time. <laughs> I didn't even know they had strawberry until they told me, and I was like, damn it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so different they, yeast strain, yeah, though, yeah. so that's okay. We're Super not, you know. original. But anyway, <laughs> we went to White Labs to go test out the different Belgian strains. And there was a Belgian yeast strain there called uh, Artisanal Belgian yeah. Yeast. And um, the descriptions of it were giving off notes of, and this is the key one, green strawberries, which means, you know, unripe strawberries. So it's a little bit more tart. Um, and I was like, sick. 
I'm gonna have both types of strawberries in here. <laughs> Green strawberries and ripe strawberries. I'm gonna tell you, on the back end. And so, yeah, and, and you get that little tartness on the back end. Um, and so yeah, so that was the fun little experiment part. I took Cody and Rule, our, our two assistant brewers, um, down to White Labs, and we tasted all these different yeast strains. And uh, we, we picked this one because we figured this would shine. Um, and I think it did. I think it did very well. I think it's great. We got to oh, brew it four I, more I times with different terrific. yeast, and then we'll know for sure. But uh, yeah, it's a fun one. Is this one experiment? I would recreate for sure. I, I'd like to do this seasonally. Just make sure you cold crash it before you put the strawberries in, though. <laughs> Whatever that means. I'll hang my head. <laughs> so, yeah, we can go into that. <laughs> That's a fun story. I love This is my favorite. The video makes it even better. But yeah. I, show you um, I was adding strawberries and I did not cold crash it to a low enough temperature, so it was still actively fermenting. Poured in five quarts of strawberries. I went to put in another five quarts of strawberries and I just saw CO2 rushing out and I just saw a geyser of beer and, and it hit that ceiling. It was out of this tank and it hit, that, <laughs> hit the ceiling over there. I was sitting up there at 5.30 on a Friday, full service, spraying everyone right here. Like being, at a, like being at a Gallagher concert. Oh, oh man, God, it, yeah. was <laughs> it was so exactly like cool that. and not cool at the same time. I guess you're seen in Beer Fest where he falls into the, uh, yeah. the vat. Yeah. yeah. I, li awesome. I was soaked. It was. I had to go change. It was uh. fun, but I'll never do that again. And yes, we learned how to add fruit to beers because it is not the same as home brewing. I'll just let everyone out there know who's watching. <laughs> and that's the fun of working with Charles uh, every day. Well, there has to be some positive to it. From oh know. man, every every day has been amazing. <laughs> I couldn't have asked for a better place to work. He really. And to go back to us all building the place, we really do care about it because we put our sweat and blood, most of us. Yeah. Or <laughs> <laughs> <Literal laughs> blood, like, into this place. And it's, it, it feels like home. Let's just touch on the, the, the way the logo. Ah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, talk about playful, right? Yeah. And so it's, and it's. I'm going to look into the camera even though they told me not yeah, to. Go, yeah, you can so, do it now. <laughs> uh, this is a uh, so viewpoint brewing the logo is actually an ambigram so the way that it works an ambigram means that you reads one way and you flip it over it reads another way so for us it's viewpoint brewing co and then it says good beer for all so you'll probably have to look on the internet for that one because you're gonna have to Zoom stare in. at it for a while um, however we also have this one that we haven't gotten too much flat for but uh, I know. <laughs> this is a rendition of uh, the princess and the toad. So, it, it perspective and, and your viewpoint and how you look at things will will ultimately <laughs> change. Uh, I'd like to see some hats made with that patches that you can flip upside down. So you know, let us know <laughs> if you'd like one. That's a uh, yeah. The hats. That's a new idea we've been coming out with. We can get uh, Velcro patches, so you can put it either way. You know, if you're happy or Cedars, sad. That's a great Frog, idea. toad, whatever comes next. I, I don't even that's, know. He'll surprise us one day. <laughs> um, so what's this? This is our Midnight Mocha. This is an Imperial Stout. 10.1%. I think I, I tasted this when I was here a couple of weeks ago, but I didn't we drink We might have one. had it on nitro. Unfortunately, we're out of the nitro kegs. I think, that's, uh, I think that was the it deal. It went pretty quick on nitro. That was awesome to see. Right now we have our brown on nitro, but this beer was our assistant brewer, one of his first recipes. That guy that's sneaking in the back. Yeah, this, this guy. <laughs> um, Everybody wants to be in show. <laughs> he's he's going to drop in here anyway. <laughs> this so, guy right here. So YouTube family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was one of his first recipes, so I uh, challenged him to make us an imperial stout, and that is not the type of beer he drinks at all. So that's why I was well, you nailed I was it. really impressed with him, and he came up with the recipe. I tweaked it to uh, our grains we had available to us for the day, uh, yeah, we all together. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it came out beautifully to me. There's no coffee in it at all, but you get nice notes of bitterness, uh, which is off of our roasted malt. And you know, and that's rusted barley. I and apologize. that's and now that you mentioned it, that's the thing. There's not a, there's not a big coffee usually it's with not these coffee. It's a bitterness you would usually pick up off the coffee, which yeah. is our viewpoint on it. Yeah. To where you read Midnight Mocha, you're thinking you're gonna get 
just a coffee bomb more and when I think of that I think of like a latte or something like that well guys as much as I would like to do this all night long we can hang out we got more tops I, more I, 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 I suspect you guys have things to do and uh, uh, I really don't but I suspect you guys do so anyway um, thanks again for the invite it's yeah. been fun cheers text miss Lily see you next time cheers mm -hmm.